Family Theater presents James Gleason, Vanessa Brown, and Dan O'Herlihy. From Hollywood, the Mutual Broadcasting System in cooperation with Family Theater brings you Vanessa Brown and Dan O'Herlihy in Heaven is Like That. And now, to introduce the drama, here is your host, James Gleason. Thank you, Tony Lafano. Just a word first about Family Theater's purpose. Family Theater seeks to promote in this world of ours the growth of family prayer, believing that by all prayer, but especially by prayer in family groups, that we can form our wills to the most powerful force in time and eternity, the wondrous will of God. And now to our drama, Heaven is Like That, starring Vanessa Brown and Dan O'Hurley. <laughs> The scene is London. At his flat in the smart West End district, Christopher Lane is giving a party. As they always do, Christopher's guests are enjoying themselves immensely. And as for Christopher himself... Chris? Yes, Mara? Let's get married. Married? Yes. You remember. People keep doing it. Why not you and I? Mara, darling, are you feeling well? Well, I most certainly am. Chris, we like each other. I'm 32 and going nowhere. You're 35 and going in the same direction. Why shouldn't we try going together? Myra, the suggestion is most flattering, but I... Well, suppose we think it over. Oh, Chris, you're wonderful. You're the most self-contained man I know. Yet, the truth is, you're still really a romanticist. Am I? Really? I think so. Mr. Lane, sir. Yes, Wilson? I beg your pardon, sir, but it's Dr. Rogers. Rogers, ask him in. I took the liberty, sir, but he says he must speak to you privately. Oh, I can't do that. I have guests. He said it was most important, sir. Oh, well. Excuse me, all of you. Rogers, old man. Hello, Chris. I've been trying to see you for days. I thought you were going to ring me up the morning after I examined you. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor, but there was no rush about it. I only bought the insurance in the first place because Freddy Tillman needs the business. You know, he and uh, Chris, I... Went... Chris, I'm serious. I've got to talk to you. All right. What's the trouble? Uh, Chris, in many ways, the medical profession has made great strides. You might even say that we've accomplished miracles. In others... Yes. we failed. Well, thus far, that is. There are certain diseases that we've been unable to conquer. And one of them is a very rare blood condition called leukemia. Yes, I've heard of it. Well, then you've undoubtedly heard, too, that at least certain cases are incurable. Yes, I think I knew that. I read... Wait a moment. You're not trying to say that... It, that I, I... That's just what I am trying to say, old chap. I don't believe it. I, I'm as well as you are. Yes, I'd have said so too, but it so happens that blood tests don't lie. I'm sorry, Chris. Believe me. Leukemia. And there's, there's nothing to be done. Well, naturally, we'll try treatment, but... How long? I want the truth. Well, a year at most. Possibly even less. A year at most. A drink, Dr. Rogers? No, no, Chris, no. And you shouldn't either. In your condition, alcohol is most dangerous. It might even hasten... Well, the... why not? Here, I give you a toast. Chris... A little out of season, but still fitting. Very fitting, Dr. Rogers. I give you a happy new year. You heard me, girl. I said another double. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Blimey. Just downs them like a leaders. Here, your money. But wait, sir, you change. How do you like that? I likes it, Amy. I likes it. Now, what are you up to, David? Nothing Davey? at all, I mean, nothing at all. But did you see that wallet on him? Jerry, Jerry lad, come on with me. <laughs> Still not clear. You say you found me in the street? About two hours ago. 
There was no one else to help you, and I, I couldn't leave you just lying there, so I brought you where I live. But how'd you get me here? You came too, enough to walk with me helping you. Who are you? My name's Eileen, sir. Oh. What sort of work do you do? Oh, uh, I'm in service. I was downstairs made to Mrs. Gamma for two years until she died last autumn. That's where I got this. Oh, a silver teapot. <laughs> it's lovely, Eileen. Mrs. Gamma gave it to you? Heavens no, not her. I left it on the fire one day and one leg melted off. See, it's just taped on now. She was frightfully angry, took full payment from my wages. So now it's, it's my personal private treasure in a way. It's all I've got, that is. Well, I should say it was a treasure. Beautiful one, Eileen. Of course, I'll first have to have it mended for him. To make his tea, I mean. Him? Now, don't tell me you have a husband. Oh, not yet. But when I get one, I will, of course, someday. Do I look like a girl who wouldn't get an husband? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I, I'm sure you'll get the very best of possible husbands. And, uh, no, I, I, I think I... Oh, you going? Yes, I, I believe I can manage now. And you've been more than kind. I'd like to show my appreciation by leaving... What is it? A minor matter, young lady. But I'll trouble you for my wallet. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come now, I won't be unreasonable. I'll pay you for your time. And we'll, well, we'll say no more about it, huh? Who's talking about pay? You were in trouble and I helped you. And incidentally helped yourself. There were 50 pounds in my wallet when I left home last night. Coo! 50 pounds? But you... Oh, that's what they were doing. Who? When I was coming up to you, I saw some men beside you, but they disappeared into the fog. And my money with them, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Believe me, I am. Perhaps if I'd come sooner... <laughs> What's funny? It's absurd, but I believe you. There's every reason in the world for me to think you're lying, but... Well, I, I know somehow that you're not. Then you know what's true. I never lie. Eileen, will you answer me one question? I'll try. What would you do if you had only one year to live? I'd pray. And after that? Oh, I don't know. I never thought. Oh, I guess I'd try to decide just who to give the teapot to. That's really all you think about? But what about yourself? What about filling those last months with, with all the pleasure you could find? <laughs> Good heavens, you don't know much, do you? Oh, don't I? Who ever heard of finding any happiness by going looking for it? But one could find it in giving things away? Of course. It's taking things from others that's hard. But giving things, that's easy. Is it? Eileen, suppose you had, well, let's say a thousand pounds to give away instead of a silver teapot. <laughs> you might as well say twenty thousand. All right, I will say twenty thousand. You see, I do have just a year to live. Oh, it's not true. I just found out myself tonight. But are you sure? It might be a mistake. Oh, it's true enough. And because it's true, well, I'm interested in what you say. Now, suppose I were to spend my last year the way you'd spend it in my place. Do you think that you could help me? Help you? You mean help you to give money away? Just that. Are you sure you're sober now? Yes, quite sober. And you ain't crazy? It's hard to tell these days. And I'm not crazy. Then why... Why would you be doing it? Well, I'm not quite sure, Eileen. Maybe it's because my year is suddenly... Well, very precious to me. I prefer to have it filled with happiness. I've already tried other recipes for that and they never worked. Perhaps yours will. Oh, I'm sure it will. Well, then. If you're positive you mean it, I'll take your offer. And I, I suppose I should say... Thank you, sir. No, Eileen. If anyone should say thank you tonight, I have an idea I'm the one. Well, here's the first installment. Go on, take it, Eileen. A thousand pounds? Actually, a thousand quid in my own hands. I suppose you've already figured how to dispose of it. Oh, yes, I have. It's 400 to Mrs. Davis, 300 for Emilio, 300 oh, for... Oh, never mind the details. I'm leaving that to you. Well, I'll bring receipts. It should be done by four o'clock. Good, then I'll meet you at my flat. Oh, 
But I couldn't do that. No? Would hardly be proper, sir. Oh. Well, uh, at your place then, huh? That's not much better. I see. Well, um, where can you suggest, considering all the proprieties, I mean? There's always a public park. Hyde Park, for instance, near Marble Arch. All right, Hyde Park near Marble Arch it is. At four o'clock. Very good, sir. And look, my name is Christopher. Christopher Lane. Yes, Mr. Lane. Christopher. Yes, Mr. Christopher. You win. Goodbye, Eileen. Till four o'clock. Yes? Would you be Mr. Christopher Lane, sir? Yes, I'm Christopher Lane. Well, a girl told me to give you this. Thank you. Oh. I say, sir. Have I been fetching all that money and without even knowing it? Yes, a thousand pounds. Oh. Listen, son, where was the girl when she gave this to you? In Mrs. Varney's rooming house in Burberry Street. She was near to crying, sir. Uh, here, you take this for your trouble. Oh, I say, a pound note. Thank you, sir. Taxi? Taxi? <laughs> You shouldn't have come, Mr. Christopher. I sent you back the money. Yes, and I think I know why. Your friends wouldn't take the money you were so anxious to give them, huh? How did you know? Oh, Mr. Christopher, I don't understand. Mrs. Davis was all of a sudden angry when I offered it. She said whatever gave me the idea, she would take charity. Emilio's father said I must have stolen the money. <laughs> How can you laugh? I've ruined everything. <laughs> well, we've just overlooked one thing. The pride of the very poor. It's infinitely stronger than the pride of the very rich. But even that is hardly an insurmountable barrier to our plan. What can we do if people won't take help when it's offered them? Well, perhaps we can masquerade it a little. We can make it look like Providence. And there's no one so poor he still doesn't believe in Providence. How do you mean? Well, now, suppose you leave that part of it to me. Very well, Mr. Christopher. Look, couldn't you call me just plain... Chris? Oh, no, sir. It would hardly be proper with my being in service and you a gentleman. <laughs> Eileen, do you know that you're an anachronism? Oh, I hope not, sir. Is it something one gets over? In your case, I doubt it very much. But you will go through with our bargain now. I don't think I could stand it. Stand what? Well, you know how it is when you're around someone you like a good deal. Even just working with them... You sometimes get attached to him, in a respectful sort of way, I mean. And you're afraid you'd get attached to me? I couldn't help it. And then to see you day after day, just waiting, knowing in my heart that someday you're... Well, I just couldn't. You mean it's my dying you're afraid of? Not just dying, but after. If we just knew what was beyond, it might be different. But I do know. And because I know, I'm not afraid. You really know? Tell me what it's like. Like? Eileen, when in all your life were you the happiest? In all my life? Oh, I guess it was the spring Mrs. Gammer took a country house. In Devonshire it was. Yes, I know Devonshire. Oh, do you now? Then you must know what I mean. The soft green rolling hills and the valleys in between with primroses and daffodils in bloom... And the house, almost like it was painted against the sky. Well, Eileen, it's, it's very much like that. You mean after? Yes. You see, most people never realize that, well, that heaven is really our, our greatest hopes come true. Complete happiness. <laughs> so surely that's no place for either of us to be afraid of, is it? <laughs> it would seem foolish. Of course it would. And now let's get to work. All right. Here's the list of people I made out. We'll take them one at a time. Now, first of all, there's Mrs. Davis. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, I'm here to represent the firm of Lane, Morgrave and Swithin. It appears that a certain sum of money has been bequeathed to you. The sum is uh, 397 pounds, nine shillings and sixpence halfpenny. Now, if you'll please sign this receipt for our files...
And I want this boy, Emilio, to have the very best of teachers, her shout. Now, for a consideration of, well, let's say, 500 pounds, could you inform Emilio's father that you decided to make the boy your protégé? But the law firm I represent feels your shop is worth 4,000 pounds, Mr. Rumpkins. And it's only right that a man of your years should retire in comfort. Yes, I know it's old furniture, Mrs. Higgins, but I'm interested in purchasing antiques. And if you'll accept payment now... <laughs> Before I finished, Mrs. Higgins had convinced herself that every kitchen chair was a priceless collector's item. Mr. Christopher, you found the strangest ways to get rid of money. Well, what's our total now? Do you have the figure? Oh, I was just checking them. By your bequests, purchases and miscellaneous means... We've given out a total of £15,465. Not bad for eight months' work, is it, Eileen? Not bad at all, That's sir. That's nearly 2000 a month, just as we planned it. I know. Here. Yeah. Yeah, why are you so depressed today? And how many times have I told you to buy a new dress? But I have, sir. Each time you told me. Well, then each new one must look just like the old one. Each new one is just like the old one. But that's absurd. Now, what about your hair? You've never fixed it right. Oh, I couldn't fluff it any more than this, sir. Come here, Eileen. Yes, Mr. Christopher. And you realize that the Lord made you beautiful because he wanted you that way. Did he, sir? Now, tomorrow, I want your hair done properly. Do you understand? That's an order. I'll try. And you'll also try to walk properly. I know. Hand me that book. This one? Yes, now. Hold it there on top of your head. Like this? Yeah. Now, walk across the room. And keep your back straight. Go on. No. No? It just happens, Mr. Christopher, that I saw that in the cinema, too. In the cinema? Yes, Pygmalion. Oh. If you have the idea of making a lady out of me, you're wasting time. Eileen, listen to me. For, for months now, I, I've wanted to tell you something. Mr. Christopher, we have work to do. Hadn't we better get back to it? Yeah. All right, Eileen. You know, you're either a very wise girl or a foolish one. I wish I was sure myself. Hello, Dr. Rogers. Hello, Chris. Doctor, what do you know of Dr. Anton Marx? Marx? Oh, yes, I've met him. He's just come here from Vienna. Yes, and there was a report in the paper this morning that he has a cure for leukemia, an operation. Yes, I know about that, Chris. You know? Mm-hmm. I decided not to tell you. Why? The Marx has a theory, and nothing more. The operation he proposes has never been performed. Of course, any patient submitting to it would be serving science, I suppose, even if only by approving the theory false. It might well be of tremendous benefit to humanity, but as to the patient surviving the operation... Uh-huh. What chance would he have? One in 500. And in my case... Without the operation. How long have I? Well, I can't be positive. You've altered things considerably by the life you're living now. If you'd gone on as you were, you wouldn't be on your feet today. You may have another six months, Chris. I see. Well, I'll take my six months and Dr. Marx can find someone else for his experiment. Well, you did wear another dress. You said I had to. What's happening? You said you had special plans this evening. Eileen, come here. Look. A dinner party. But there's only two places. For us? Have you forgotten what night this is? What night? An anniversary, Eileen. It was a year ago tonight that you discovered me on Burberry Street. A but year? I but I thought... Uh, so did I. But I saw Dr. Rogers again today, and for my good behavior, it seems I get time on. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> so am I. There's another reason for tonight. I wanted to give you this. What is it? A deed, Eileen. A deed to a farm in Devonshire. Green rolling hills with flowers in the valley and just one house that looks painted against the sky. You didn't. Well, why should I give it to everyone else? But not to the one person who taught me the real joy of giving. Oh, Mr. Christopher. Eileen, will you go there with me? For, for whatever time is left. I, I want to ask you to... I can't. You mustn't ask me. I want you to marry me, Eileen. And who am I to marry you? You're the girl I love. 
The girl who loves me. I'm going away. Our work's done, our agreement's ended, so I'll... I'll just say goodbye, Mr. Christopher. But Eileen, Eileen, you can't have understood. I love you. Please let me go. And forgive me if I can't stay for the party, but I couldn't. There are times when all things have to end, once and for all. Why did you have to put it into words? Wait, wait. At least let me send you home in a taxi. No. If I'm going back to my own life, I'd as well start right now. I'll take the underground. Goodbye. Beg pardon, sir, but wouldn't you like more light in here? Uh, no. You still wouldn't care to eat? No. no I, I, here is a special alarm, announcement you. from the BBC. Turn off that wire. Very good, sir. I... I... The no, 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 wait. Less than an hour ago. An unknown number of persons are dead and scores injured in the crash near Burberry Street Station. Burberry Street. Further details Mr. will Lane, be broadcast sir, as soon as received. And... <laughs> And we've done everything possible, Chris. But with a spinal fracture, well... There's no hope at all? I'm sorry. Yeah. May I go in now? Certainly. Eileen. Oh, Mr. Christopher. Now I really have spoiled the anniversary, haven't I? Eileen... Yes? Surely it doesn't matter now. Matter? The gentleman and the serving girl. That couldn't make a difference at a time like this. I don't suppose it could. I do love you, Eileen. So much. And I... I love you, Chris. There must be a clergyman in the hospital. All right. I'd be happy to marry you, Chris. <laughs> whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Eileen. About the teapot, you'd better give it to some girl who's not married. I will. And have it mended so she can make tea for her man when she finds him. I'll have it mended. Christopher. Yes? Would you tell me once again? Tell you? What it's like after heaven is really... Our, our greatest hopes come true. Complete happiness. Yes, yes, and more. Because I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, what things God has prepared for those who love him. And there's, there's nothing to be afraid of, because... Eileen... Eileen. Chris, it's still not too late for you to change your mind. I'm not going to, Rogers. Oh, don't do it, I beg of you. Forget that you ever heard of this operation. You're sure that my doing this can be of benefit to science, whatever the outcome? Well, there's no doubt of that, but even so... Then I'm ready, and nothing you can say will change my mind. Very well. We'll take him into surgery, nurse. Rogers. Yes, Chris? <laughs> don't look so worried, old man. Well, I told you before what the chances are, Chris. At best, one in 500. Well, you can even it to one in a thousand. Fear at a time like this is... Well, it's only for those who are in doubt of what lies beyond. You see, I have no doubt, Rogers. And I'm more than ready for whatever comes. This is Jim Gleason again, and a little story to tack onto our drama. Not too many years ago, we were on location, making a picture that required a few sequences to be photographed at sea. 
During the course of events, we had the good fortune to visit one of those lonely lighthouses that you'll find at various spots along our coast. You can picture the kind I mean. Well, anyway, this one was like a great white finger set off from the mainland and perched on one, well, I would guess was a rock shoal. The boat that brought us alongside brought newspapers and provisions. The lighthouse keeper was, of course, grateful for these, but what really pleased him most was just our little visit. We didn't have much to say, nothing startling or original anyway, but what delighted him was that we were there saying it. I've traveled a lot since then, but my mind keeps going back to that lighthouse, and I think I can find in the incident a parallel to be related to prayer. Our prayers are little visits to the great celestial lighthouse keeper who makes his perpetual light to shine down upon us. Doesn't matter much what we say, it's the fact that we are there saying it, remembering him for remembering us. Family Theater again reminds you, the family that stays together, prays together, stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Hollywood Family Theater has brought you Vanessa Brown and Dan O'Herlihy in Heaven is Like That. James Gleason was your host. Others in our cast were Ben Wright, Norma Field, Martha Shaw, Mona Keneally, Tudor Owen, and Shelley Berman. The script was written by True Bortman, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which responds to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week at the same time when Family Theater will present Marta Torn and Arthur Shields in The Right Approach. Join us, won't you? and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System.